So uh, great talks today by uh, two experts in the field. And I'm going to be kind of wrapping up here with a procedure called spinal cord stimulation. This is uh, also known as neuromodulation. And uh, before we get into it, I'm going to kind of talk about maybe a little um, a different way to look at opioids than uh, Dr. Irfan just talked about. So opioids are pain medications, and I'm talking about Vicodin, Percocet. And uh, Dr. Irfan had a really nice infographic about the use of opiates in the USA. Um, I forgot what, the, what Americans make up total world population, but we do use over 90% of the world's Vicodin in this country. 4.4%, okay, so we have an encyclopedia over here. 4.4% is, is American, so, but we use 90% of uh, Vicodin, also known as hydrocodone. Um, the amount of opiate prescriptions have quadrupled since 1999, but the amount of pain patients report remains unchanged. 249 million prescriptions for opiates were written in 2013, so, so that's one per almost every American at that time. Nearly two million people abused or were, were dependent on prescription opiates in 2014. So we have like this major problem with opiate addiction and overdose and dependency. Now they're all different, but they're all a major uh, concern for um, our country. Recently, a study, or it was actually a very uh, elegant study called the OPAL study, which is opioid, opiate use uh, in lower back pain showed two really interesting things. This is not on my slide, but I just wanted to bring this up. So they looked at acute low back pain and the use of painkillers like Vicodin, Percocet, uh, maybe some of the other heavy hitter ones. But the study was v quite conclusive that at six weeks, there was really no difference between the use of opiates versus placebo. And at one year, the outcomes were actually worse for patients on opiates versus placebo. Now that being said, as a, we're all pain specialists, there's so many different ways to treat pain. And I don't think one modality is better than the other. We want to kind of use all the modalities to help our patients. All right. So how can interventional pain physicians help? Okay. So chronic pain is defined as pain that lasts longer than three months, although some places say six months. Um, we can help where a significant amount of medication may be required to relieve pain. So patients will typically go to a primary care doctor first for, for pain, some type of pain. And by the way, the number one reason in this country to go to a primary care physician is pain. Um, and sometimes when, when pain medication doesn't work, what do we do? That's when patients will come to a pain specialist for procedures. So I'm going to talk about spinal cord stimulation. Oh, I can't even read this, but um, I'll read it to you. But taking a step back, you know, when I was in medical school and growing up, I didn't know what pain management was. Uh, I got these two brothers from Canada that I just ate lunch with today. It's, this is, pain management's not a very well-known specialty in other parts of the world. Now, that being said, pain should be considered like a chronic disease. There's no cure for pain just like there's no cure for high blood pressure. If somebody has high blood pressure, we can manage it by changing their diet. We can change it by giving them certain types of medication. It's just like diabetes, it's like depression. We can't cure it, we can manage it. And that's why uh, pain management, that's why patients will help, will, be, uh, will come to us for, for help with uh, chronic pain. So spinal cord stimulation is a procedure that we do, and we're gonna go over it, that we can use to help our patients in pain. Um, one of the things I was telling some uh, people the other day, or yesterday actually, after my talk, surgeries, you know, not everyone is a candidate for surgery. What if somebody's 85 years old with a bad knee and they have a ejection fraction of 15%, which means basically they have an unhealthy heart. What if they have uh, been smoking for 60 years and they have poor lungs and they can't tolerate anesthesia? What, what do you do for these people? Can you give them an opiate? Maybe, but opiates also slow down your respirations, which can cause, it can easily uh, overdose a person, they can die. Can you do a procedure? Maybe, but then we should see if they're on blood thinners or if they have any other contraindication. So it's very important to take each patient individually and see if they're a candidate for a procedure. 
Um, so spinal cord stimulation is one of those procedures that, uh, in my opinion, is, is relatively safe, quite safe actually. It's FDA approved, it's reversible, it has no, there's no drugs involved. And um, basically what it is is these, uh, you see these two leads, these are insulated wires and these little black spaces, they're called contacts. And what spine, uh, well, we're gonna get into it, but what these things do is they send a small electrical current that feels warm and very pleasant to the spinal cord. So just so you know, all our pain, it's in our heads, okay? If you step on uh, a nail, the pain's actually, I mean, it hurts in our foot, but the brain is where we're processing that pain, okay? So somebody with chronic pain, how do we get them to snap out of this if we can't see something on MRI or we have some type of evidence, what is causing this pain? So what spinal cord stimulation does is it will interrupt the pain pathway from wherever their pain is coming from. Indications, so chronic intractable pain of the trunk or limbs, patients who have failed back surgery syndrome, which is uh, also known as post lamp formerly known as post-laminectomy syndrome, something called uh, CRPS or RSD. So RSD is reflex sympathetic dystrophy. There was, uh, it's kind of the older term now. It's called complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, intractable low back pain, leg pain. And now one of the companies actually is FDA approved for um, diabetic pain. So in diabetic patients, uh, they get something called a neuropathy or nerve pain. Okay, who can benefit from spinal cord stimulation when medications or surgery is not an option? So again, we'll take that 85-year-old with a, let's just say they had previous back surgery, they are unhealthy, they're obese, this may be a good uh, modality to help. Uh, when they have tried, when patients have tried and failed other modalities, so physical therapy, uh, TENS unit, which is kind of like an electrical exterior, external system, patients who have had other types of nerve blocks like epidurals uh, or something called radio frequency. Uh, when patients have, uh, are trying other modalities, including medications that are not working, and if they have pain in their uh, back, legs, feet, arms. And, and just so, uh, just as a kind of an aside, there's, I would say there's three types of surgery to avoid if possible. So back is one, because the data is simply not that good shoulders and feet. Okay, so this is what a spinal cord stimulator, the placement of the leads look like. So what it is is basically one will take an epidural needle, so what basically pregnant women get during labor, it's a slightly larger needle, and we place it in an area called the epidural space, which is right above uh, something called the dura, which contains uh, spinal fluid or cerebrospinal fluid. The goal is to place an electrical wire carefully. Uh, so this on the left is at this area called T12L1. And the reason we know that is T stands for thoracic. You can see the little shadows on each side. T12 is the lowest area where the ribs are. So we go right below that and we carefully place a wire and we thread it up to the desired area, typically T8 or T7, so around the mid thoracic spine. So this is just another image. On the right is something called the lateral view on fluoroscopy, which is a very low dose radiation modality for uh, radiology. Uh, and we can see the leads are what's called posterior. If they're anterior, uh, you're gonna get, patients usually get stimulation to their, to their belly. So while we're doing this procedure, while a patient's awake, while a patient's awake, thanks, um, we wanna see where they're, feeling the sensation from the stimulator leads. So I always keep my patients awake and I ask them if their pain is essentially, you know, better or gone, where I place the leads. All right, so this is an invasive procedure, but it's two stages. The first stage is something we call a trial, and this is temporary. And what it involves is just placing the wires in their epidural space, and we wanna make sure that their pain is at least 50% better. Uh, we usually go for, I mean, 80, but we'll take 50. And I wanna see two things. I wanna see one is essentially increased function, so increased activity, 
and two, if there's pain medication reduction, because as we know, uh, Dr. Irfan eloquently said, there can be some serious side effects from opiate medications. Once a trial is deemed successful, then we can surgically implant, uh, implant the, uh, the system. So this, this is what uh, the trial looks like. I know this is a little, this is not my patient, mine's much cleaner, but um, I found this on Google. Basically, you can see in the lower back, it's a, there's no incisions, it's all done with needles. We place a small wire, uh, typically two, and then they're coming out and then we have them taped to a person's back and we have, a, we have an external stimulator to send the current to the spinal cord. I usually don't have a patient shower, they can, uh, I'm sorry, I can, they can usually sponge bathe and they do have some restrictions, I don't want them moving because the leads can move. Okay, some, so some considerations for spinal cord stimulation. Now, is this, a, is this a permanent cure? Unfortunately, it's not. But with advanced technology, we do get better programming. Typically, I tell patients, it's like a hip replacement. It'll last about 10 to 15 years before you have to do something else. Um, Long-term risk, there's always a risk of infection. The biggest one is the leads in the back if they move because if they move, then we have to redo the whole procedure. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, that's actually my last slide. So um, I really appreciate your time. JazakAllah.